Good evening, folks. Good evening, folks. I want to thank you for inviting me into your home tonight to talk to you about an extremely important issue to you. I, I basically uh, uh, am here to talk about the United States Constitution and our government and uh, some of the principles that uh, you need to understand most thoroughly so that you can have an effective opportunity to exercise your constitutional rights. The whole purpose of this is that you understand that these these rights come from God, okay, that they are God-inspired. God is the one who, who endowed us with these rights, and that this Constitution merely uh, offers a legitimate program to protect that all of us can have the rights equally, and, and, and as long as we respect our neighbor and allow them also to have the rights equally, the, the, the protections are, are, are going to last forever. As, and, and the reality is that we are going to get thoroughly into your constitution. We want you to find a constitution wherever you can, and we are going to basically take you step by step through some of the most important parts of this constitution so that you can better exercise your rights in a timely fashion. Now, the facts are simple. If you don't know your rights, you don't have any rights, and that's just the way it is. And if you certainly couldn't exercise those rights timely if you don't know what they are, so what's going to happen is they're going to tell you what your rights are, and do you think they're going to tell you in your favor? Certainly not. Now, We've come a long way to put this program on to help you. By the way, my name is Carl Miller. I want to thank you again for inviting me into your home. We're going to proceed with vigor. Uh, I should tell you a few things about me, that I'm a, a prior service soldier. I served three combat tours in the Republic of Vietnam. I should tell you that I was a participant in the top secret project called Blue Book, where the officers in the jungle smelled a rat in a woodpile, and they decided to pull their, their top soldiers aside and they said, come on over here, let's come on over here, we want to talk to you. And they took their top soldiers in the corner, and they started teaching them things like duty, honor, country, pride in the core. They taught us history. They taught us all kind of a, a programming as far as what's going on in our government. They taught us the Constitution. We had to be able to rattle the Constitution off just like we would any manual of arms. And this all took place to totally top secret so that we wouldn't offend any uh, chains of command or any uh, presidential problems similar to what... Uh, happened between General MacArthur. Yeah, the bottom line is uh, this was taken totally uh, upon their own, shall we say, careers to pull this thing off. And uh, they, this happened all throughout a lot of the military services in Vietnam. Uh, Marine Corps, Air Force, Army, we all, they all pulled aside their best people and they started putting everything on and teaching us our Constitution. So I'm going to try and instill in you that flame that was instilled in me over 25 years ago, in which I have, been, I have been transferring ever since. I have been fighting tooth and nail to defend the Constitution. I have helped thousands and thousands and thousands of other people do the same. I teach people how to be their own counsel, to stand up in courts of law, and be able to exercise their constitutional rights in a timely and effective manner. And uh, the good Lord willing, I'll be able to keep doing that. So why don't we uh, right now try and get into some parts of the Constitution. The most important thing that I can teach you about this Constitution is the importance of reading it. You must read the Constitution and understand what physically is involved. You must know your rights and timely assert them. That is your burden. If you do not, then a legal term called latches incurs is in full force. Latches is a legal term which is defined as, an, as a... Latches is a species of action wherein a party of reasonable intelligence and integrity, having a right to take an action as is prescribed by law and having failed to timely do so, loses all right to proceed. So what is actually happening out there, folks, is that latches is incurring because most people don't read their constitution and know what's involved. So then you are left to being told, well, that's what it means. Okay, so you just got to do what you got to do and you're told and, and they're going to tell you in favor of them. They're not going to tell you in favor of you. So it's better for you to read the book and understand what's in it. It's not a very big book. I, I highly recommend the book. I, you can get several versions. Uh, a lot of times you contact your congressman. Uh, my congressman, Dominic Vincentini, uh, state senator, supplied this one for me. Uh, John Kuhn, a libertarian candidate, has supplied several also. Uh, some of these folks, uh, just check with your local... Uh, congressman or state rep, a lot of times you can they'll just give you one. If you cannot find one, go down to your United States uh, government building here in the Detroit vicinity. We, it's called the McNamara Building on the first floor. 
And uh, what we do then is we uh, go into the government printing office, and usually they're about a buck. But I highly recommend you go get one. I, I don't leave home without mine. I usually have three or four of them someplace. And I hand them out also myself. I give them out to whoever. I, I think one of the most kindest things I can do to a person is give them this book and show them how it works. This book is kind of like a genie in a bottle. If you know how to stroke this book, I'm telling you, the genie comes out. And it usually, with a force that, that you, it will be clearly recognized in any court in the land. Now that doesn't mean it'll be easy. You might have to work a little bit. But basically there's an argument. And it comes like this. If I violate your rights, you may or may not know about it. If you know about it, you may or may not be able to do something about it. If you do have an ability to do something about it, you may or may not have the financial wherewithal to, to go to a finished program. If you do have the, the financial wherewithal, you may not have the intestinal fortitude to go to a finished program. So most of the time, your governments and your, your abusive uh, personalities in government or your corporations uh, pretty much have carte blanche to, to injure you. Because in 99.9% .9 of the cases, nobody, most people will not proceed. But every now and then, you run into that one hard nut, and he doesn't quit or she doesn't quit till the cows come home. And what happens is that person will prevail. And those are the people that are actually generating better protections and better constitutional rights for you. Those are the ones that are going to the Supreme Courts and the Courts of Appeals and what have you that are pushing, that are spending their life funds to allow you to have the benefit. But if you aren't there to catch the benefit, then you, you the benefit is lost. So we're going to get right into the Constitution. We're going to teach you some things about it. Pay attention because we're really doing this out of an act of love for you. And we're hoping to God you're going to pick up on it and pay attention. Okay? Now... I'm going to put one constitution down here so the folks can see it. I will open this up from time to time to demonstrate things to you. I will basically try and read out of another constitution so that we can better show you some of the things that are involved. Now, it's important that you understand that this constitution is in writing. It's important that you understand that it is a legal document, okay? That it was ratified by all of the members in a Congress together, right? And that that document can be, you can get all the signatures on the document. Okay? And it's important that you understand that there was an offer, government offered to govern. There was a consideration. The citizens considered how they were going to be governed. And government promised that they would govern by Constitution. And there was an agreement. The citizens agreed that if government promised there would be a government by constitution that they would agree to allow the constitution to into force. Now there's a unique situation here. It's very rare when you find the party of the first part, which is the congressmen, officers of the government, who are also parties of the second part, as representatives of we the people, the republic. And when they signed the document, they signed the document as officers of government, agreeing to the constitution, and simultaneously as officers of representatives of the people in the Republican form of government. And when they signed that document, that constituted a ironclad contract in writing enforceable in a court of law pursuant to the statute of frauds. Here in the state of Michigan, that's 566.132 Michigan Compile Laws Act, which basically states anything in writing is enforceable in a court of law pursuant to the statute of frauds. Now all we're asking is that they enforce the contract. We want them to enforce the contract. In other words, if we read something in here, and we got a good reason for why we believe it's the way it is, then they should honor that. And they should honor it in favor of you, the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary. But I'll get into that a little later. The program that you should understand, especially, is Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution. This is called the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution. It's located at Article 6. Everybody see that? Paragraph 2, which is going to start right here, and I'm going to read it to you, okay? And basically what it says is this, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and the treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution 
or laws of any state to the contrary are notwithstanding. And when they say notwithstanding, that means notwithstanding in law. That means that's a legal definition. Notwithstanding means notwithstanding in law. Now, a very important case, Marbury versus Madison, 5 U.S. 137. Pardon my reaching here. Marbury versus Madison, 5 U.S. 137. It's recorded at volume 5, right here. It's an 1803 case, Marbury versus Madison. It's recorded in volume 5, page 137. Now, basically what this case states, and, and I'm telling you right now, if you want to use a case to cite for any purpose in court, you have to read the case. If you haven't read the case, you haven't read the case and formed a basis upon which a logical determination in your mind could have been reached to form an opinion as to why you should do what you're going to do, then the judge will throw your case out. So read your cases. Don't just quote cases because that won't, you won't win. If the judge ever pins you down and starts asking you some merits of the case and you can't even understand what the case is about, nine times out of ten, he's just going to throw your case in, in, the, in the can. So make sure you read the case. This is one of the leading cases in the history of the United States of America. The opinion of the court was given by the Honorable Judge John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. His opinion was, anything that is in conflict is null and void of law. Clearly, he said, that for a secondary law to come in conflict with the supreme law was illogical. For certainly the supreme law would prevail over all other law. And certainly our forefathers had intended that the supreme law would be the basis of all law. And for any law to come in conflict would be null and void of law. It would bear no power to enforce. It would bear no obligation to obey. It would purport to settle as if it never existed, for unconstitutionality would date from the enactment of such a law, not from the date so branded in an open court of law. No courts are bound to uphold it, and no citizens are bound to obey it. It operates as a mere nullity or a fiction of law, which means it doesn't exist in law. Now let me give you an example in today's timing as to how effective this is. This argument is so effective that it literally nullifies the Brady Bill. It nullifies the crime bill that takes away the right of the people to keep and bear arms on these 19 weapons that turn into 159 weapons. It uh, stops this 666 bill that just went through that they're trying to take away the Fourth Amendment. You see, because they have no power to pass a law that's in conflict with the United States Constitution. And it's automatically null and void of law from its inception, not from the date you go to court and brand it as unconstitutional. Now, I want to get that real clear. A lot of people think that they got to go to court and brand it unconstitutional. I'm here to tell you, if you know your arguments and you can show your arguments, most of the time you will win. Every now and then you run into a hard nose, but I'll show you how to deal with him too. Okay? But for now... I want everybody that's got a chance to go out to learn your Constitution, your Article 6, Paragraph 2 of your Constitution. I want you to, to pay attention to what's going on here. Learn to read about this Marbury versus Madison case. I want to show you, pardon my reach again, this right here is an example of what is called Shepherd Citations. Shepherd Citations is a group of reporters that go through and keep track of all the court cases that have come before the courts, especially the Supreme Court. And they clarify before the court all of the cases. Each one of these little numbers here represents somebody hiring a lawyer and going to the Supreme Court. Every one of these. There's nine pages of these folks. Almost 200 years worth that goes against this case, Marbury versus Madison. And I want to tell you, this case is still supreme law of the land. If it wasn't, you would see O's in here where it was overturned, okay? You don't see any O's. There aren't any O's. That means the case is standing. There'd be an O in this column right next to here. You don't see any O's because there's no case that could come up against this case. That's how strong this case is, folks. Now, this is nine pages. Each one, This is two pages each. There's nine pages of this. This represents, if I was to... Def to, to try and teach you what this represents, if I was building a wall from here to the moon, out of bricks, that's what that would mean in legal terms. Because that's how solid this case is. 
So it's very important that you understand your Constitution is an ironclad contract in writing enforceable in the court of law. It's very important that you understand Article 6, Paragraph 2, the Supremacy Clause, which says the Constitution and the laws and pursuance thereof and the treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. The judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in conflict or repugnancy is null and void of law. It bears no power to enforce, no obligation to obey, purports to settle as if it never existed. Unconstitutionality dates from the enactment. No courts are bound to uphold it. No citizens are bound to obey it. Now that is one of the most important lessons that I can teach you on the Constitution so that you can understand how strong this document is. You see. And when I go to the law library and I hit some of these law libraries, it's wall-to-wall -wall books, folks. I mean, it's like I take people down there and their chin's on the ground. And then I tell them, there's three floors of this place just like this, filled to the brim with books and books. And did you know that in every one of those cases, this little book right here, this one right here, folks, controls every single book in that law library, every single one. Every single book in that law library is controlled by this little book. So can you understand how important it is for you to know what's in this little book so that you can effectively call on that kind of a commanding knowledge? Okay? It is absolutely vital that you get a hold of one of these books and start learning it and don't let anybody take away your constitutional rights. You, cannot, you can't even give your constitutional rights away. You have to voluntarily acquiesce by signing a document on a Miranda release form. That's how hard it is to give away your constitutional rights. We don't want you to give away any of your rights. We want you to know these rights backward, forward, upside down, and other. We want you to be able to rattle them off. Our soldiers could do it. And they did it with, with the great love in their heart and the pride and the, and the duty that they hold in their heart. And they swore on a sacred oath that they defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And then they perform their duties to the best of their ability, so help them God. And by God, they do, both in the service and out of the service, okay? We defend the Constitution to the death. We never surrender. We are soldiers, above all. And we love our country and our flag and our Constitution. We are what the, the term is under the, the military code of conduct. I am an American fighting soldier. I serve the forces which guard my country and its constitutional way of government. I am prepared to give my life if necessary in defense of that Constitution. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So I want you to pay attention. A lot of brave soldiers have died to pay for this book so that you could have the right. And the least you could do for your own self's sake is to learn what's in this book and be able to argue effectively what's in this book. You would be amazed how many times you can win if you just have this book and know what's in it. Okay? Now, that we get that by, we're going to go into some other arguments here. We're going to try and show you how to really effectively use this book. Okay? Now that everybody's got that in hand. The next thing we're going to start teaching you is things like about the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is one of the biggies that everybody talks about today and the one that gets railroaded probably the most. The next is the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment, okay? But the Second Amendment is one of the most vital amendments here because our forefathers had such an important understanding of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, that was the First Amendment, that they turned around and realized that without the right to protect that first right, they didn't have that right. So the Second Amendment, they, they instituted the right of the people to keep and carry arms and that right shall not be infringed. Now, they started out by saying a well-regulated militia being necessary for the maintenance of a free state. Okay? Isn't that a true statement, folks? A well-regulated militia is necessary for the security of a free state. That's just a true statement. So is oranges are orange. That's why they call them oranges. Okay? But that doesn't have any legal precedence in theory. The most important part about that Second Amendment is it says the right of the people. And the Supreme Court has ruled in hundreds of cases that whenever it says the right of the people, it means the right each of every single citizen to possess the right equally. Now, a lot of guys like to hand out this Manola that, well, that's a collective right. You've got to be a member of the militia. That's all who done. You don't have to be a member of the militia. All you have to do is be an American. You have the right. The right to keep and carry arms, and that right shall not be infringed. Now you will note after infringed, there is no subparagraph A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which would stipulate as to what would be an acceptable infringement. So all infringement is forbidden. Now who says so? You say so. Do you see that? Does everybody see that? You say so. Who are you? I'm an American. And I'm telling you, you're infringing my rights. You're stealing my rights. I, I, I claim infringement. I claim encroachment. I claim impingement. I claim usurpation. I claim you're stealing my right. Because that's what they're doing. 
And I ask him, what is it you don't understand about the word infringement? Because that's exactly what it says when you look in Black's Law Dictionary. That's another thing I want to bring up. When you want to talk to these people in court, you want to get a hold of one of these books, right here. It's called Black's Law Dictionary. You would be absolutely amazed what's in Black's Law Dictionary. This is the exact words. <coughs> Just a second, please, folks. This is the exact words that you need to be able to definitively define the word game problem that we are having with these people today. They like to keep changing the words. But guess what? The words in this book are the words that were written when we were in the Constitution when it was signed. And the definitions that are in this book are enforceable in a court of law. You can bring this book into court and pull it open and say, this is the one, Judge. And they gots to listen. And that's the way it is. So for sure, if you're going to be in this, go down to one of your bookstores, uh, whichever you may have in your area, Barnes & Noble or any one of the dozens of decent bookstores, and get a copy of Black's Law Dictionary. You need that to be in this because this is kind of like... Uh, defining the map of how to get from A to B. You have to have this book to be able to pull it out so that you can turn around and tell them, hey, don't trample my rights. I take a real dim view of that. Another good book you can pick up on the Constitution is this, this American Constitution put out by West Publishing Company. This goes into a whole lot of widened arguments as to your constitution. Now, after I'm finished talking to you, you're going to have a new concept of constitution and how it works. You're going to understand that it's what you say it is. If you got an honest right, now I'll give you a perfect example. Now, the First Amendment basically talks about the right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, right? But isn't the right to work part of right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? you got a right to work, right? Contract your labor, your skill, and your time of life as you see fit, right? Does that make sense to you? That's a First Amendment right. Another First Amendment right would be the right to travel freely unencumbered. See, no state can require you to have a license to travel freely unencumbered, and we'll go into that and show you how that is, is taken care of. Okay? The bottom line is you need to learn as much as you absolutely possibly can in the shortest possible time about your Constitution, because I'm telling you right now as we speak, they are trying to curtail that Constitution and take away rights that you have that have been given to you from your forefathers. There's only one thing that's going to stop that. Well, maybe two. There's two things. The first thing that's going to stop that, if all of us get together, get a hold of one of these books and start shaking it and say, Whoa, R.C., we're not letting you take away that Constitution. This is America. we got an American flag on a pole out front. Last time I checked, this is the United States of America. we got a Constitution here, and you ain't touching that Constitution. So you call up that Bill McCollum in Washington and you tell him, he's the guy that sponsored that 666 bill to take away the Fourth Amendment right to, uh, to have a search warrant. You get a hold of him and I'll give you his number later on in the speech here. And you call that joker up and you say, sir, what is it you don't understand about your oath of office? We kind of like you to leave the Constitution alone. As a matter of fact, we'd like you to make it stronger than it is, not take nothing away from it. <clears throat> Period. And we resent the hell out of you taking an oath of office to protect the Constitution and we put you in office, and the first thing you do when you get in there is try and scuttle the Constitution and flush it down the toilet. We're not going to put up with that stuff. We want you to understand that real clearly. The second way we can do it is if necessary and proper, our militias can come together and decide to tell these people that are giving aid and comfort to the enemies of our country by breaking down our laws that you have broken the law of Title 18, United States Code, Section 2381, which says that in the presence of two witnesses to the same overt act or in an open court of law, if you fail to timely move to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and honor your oath of office, you are subject to the charge of capital felony treason, and upon conviction you will be taken by the posse to the nearest and busiest intersection and at high noon hung by the neck until dead. The body to remain in state until dusk as an example to anyone who would take their oath of office lightly. You see, without that oath of office, this Constitution is worthless. That's why we have you take that oath of office, so that we know you will honor this oath of office and that you will keep our Constitution. We don't want anybody taking our Constitution away. And we're here to tell you right now, don't do it. We'll take a dim view of it. We probably will charge you. And we're not fooling around. Okay? Now, let's get into some other things in the Constitution. The bottom line here is you have to know to be able to exercise your Constitution. 
The most important parts about your Constitution are in your first ten amendments, okay? Obviously, the right of the people to keep and carry arms shall not be infringed. And that right shall not be infringed. You must claim your right if you want to have it. You have to be willing to do that. And if they are going to take your right, then you have to be willing to challenge them, whatever it costs. Now, the bottom line is any law that comes in conflict with that, what do we talk about in Article 6, Paragraph 2? If any law shall come in conflict with this, the supreme law, what happens? It's null and void of law. It bears no power to enforce, no obligation to obey, purports to settle as if it never existed, unconstitutionality dates from the enactment of such a law, not from any date so branded in open court of law. So what happened to the Brady Bill, folks? Canceled due to lack of interest. Okay? What happened to the crime bill with the gun infringements? If any portion of the bill be unconstitutional, the whole bill is unconstitutional. Because why? Repugnancy. Okay? It's repugnant to the United States Constitution. It's null and void of law. It bears no power to enforce, no obligation to obey. It purports to settle as it ever existed. Which case said so? Marbury versus Madison, 5 U.S. 137, 1803. That's how important that case is. That's why you got to go down to your law library and read. Okay? So Marbury versus Madison is extremely important. It's important that you be able to read the case, understand what they're talking about. Now, other cases that are involved are your rights to due process, like under your Fourth and Fifth and Sixth Amendments, right? The right of the people to be secure in their houses. The right of the people to be secure in their person, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. And obviously that would imply, that would imply, that would imply that he'd gone before a judge and said, this is the guy, he did it, this is the crime that was done, and this is the evidence we're looking for, judge, and we'd like to get a warrant, and we're swearing on everything we told you is the God's truth, and then they can come over and they can search till hell freezes over. Okay? Does that sound logical to you? No, that's what Bill 666 is trying to throw out. They don't want you to have that right anymore. Now it's important for you to immediately jump to the Ninth Amendment. What does the Ninth Amendment say? Enumeration in this Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Now basically what that means in simplest of terms, Congress has no authority to add on to the Constitution in such a way that would take away rights previously guaranteed. What seems to be Mr. McCollum's problem? Does he not read the King's English? <coughs> Excuse me. Simply spoken, he has no authority to pass this 666 bill. The Congress had no authority to pass this Brady bill. They had no authority to pass this crime bill because it clearly infringed on the United States Constitution. I don't care how noble the issue it was. I don't care how learned the people claim to be. They weren't learned enough. Because if they were learned, they would have understood the Ninth Amendment forbids adding on to the Constitution by any laws whatsoever that takes away rights that are previously guaranteed. Excuse me. Now, let's go on. Let's hit the Tenth Amendment. The powers not delegated to the United States. What, is there, what are they talking about here? The powers not <laughs> delegated to the United States by the Constitution. Nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectfully or to the people. See, this is a limited contract. This contract is designed to limit government. And when you get into your police powers, you start understanding your police powers. Almost you'll hear this all the time. Well, we have police powers. Broad and sweeping police powers. You look up Black's Law Dictionary of Police Powers. It says, The law of eminent domain of a state or political subdivision to enact laws for the common good and welfare and to curb crime. And in great big black letters, it says, Within constitutional limitations. See the Tenth Amendment. Well, when they're talking about see the Tenth Amendment, this is the Tenth Amendment they're talking about. Now, do they have powers to take away previous rights guaranteed under the Constitution? The answer is obviously no, they don't. Obviously, the Ninth Amendment sets a clear limit on that. What is it these guys don't understand about their Constitution? They pass these Brady bills, they pass these crime bills, they pass these 666 bills to take away your Fourth Amendment right, requiring a search warrant. What is it that they don't understand about the locks on the Constitution? Now, do you see how wise our forefathers were? They knew. They knew history. And they knew 
that history repeats itself if people forget. So what they did is they set a standard very importantly toward the end of the contract that clearly stipulated exactly what limits would be there. You see. And it clearly stipulated that no power has existed to take away rights that were previously guaranteed. So how therefore is this being done? I'll tell you how it's being done. Cause wants to. And they're not doing it by law. Now why are they getting away with it? Because most of the people don't know any better. And if you don't know your rights and you don't timely assert them, latches and curse, latches being a species of action where in a party of reasonable intelligence and integrity having a right to take an action as is prescribed by law and having failed to timely do so loses all right to proceed. So by you acquiescing, by not jumping up and saying, hey, hold the line, Chester. You ain't touching that Fourth Amendment. You aren't touching that Second Amendment. We're not putting up with that stuff. You took an oath of office, we're going to hold you to it. You violate that oath of office, we're going to charge you with capital felony treason under Title 18 United States Code, Section 2381. What difference does it make if they're in open rebellion against the United States or if they're breaking down the laws creating the rebellion? Isn't that giving aid and comfort to the enemies of our country? It most certainly is. And it's called sedition. Treason by sedition. Okay? Now we got to start collaring these guys and telling them, hey... What is it you don't understand about the Constitution and your oath of office? We're going to clearly correct that in the short interim. And if you don't want to fix it, we will remove you. And that's our duty and our responsibility. Now, when Benjamin Franklin walked out of all of the hearings to set up this Constitution, a lady reporter walked up to him and asked him, What is it we have now? And he turned to her and told her, We have a republic if we can keep it. Obviously, the burden is on us to make sure we keep it. So I'm asking you to get a hold of one of these constitutions, and let's plan on keeping it. All right, now let's get into some more of the arguments on the Constitution. Your Fifth Amendment. Let's pull up your Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on the presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war. Or public danger, nor shall any person be subject to the same offense be twice put in jeopardy, that's the double jeopardy statute, of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any crime, criminal case, to be a witness against himself, that's a self-incrimination defense, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, that's your equal protection clause. You have an equal right to all of, the, all of your rights under the law, and you have a right to due process of law. As a matter of fact, if they don't give you due process of law, Title V, United States Code, Section 556D, is clear and specific, and it says if they deny you due process of the law, all jurisdiction ceases automatically. That's, that's Title V, United States Code, Section 556D, also 557, and Section 706 of that code. In other words, if they deny you due process at any time, and you can prove it, you can, you can force a showdown and you can turn around and say, well, they might have had jurisdiction at one time, Judge, but they lost it when they denied me due process. All right? Now, the other parts are you cannot deny them life, liberty, property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. You know, how many times do you hear about that today? I mean, it's incredible. The Sixth Amendment is another important one. All of them are important, but there are more important ones, all right? In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and the cause of the action and accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him. That's the right to confront your accusers. To have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in your favor. That's the subpoena rights and to have the assistance of counsel for your defense, or you can stand as your own counsel. And I know they tell you that it's a fool that stands as his own counsel, but it's my argument that it's a fool that doesn't. Because I'll tell you why. You know your case better than, you, better than anybody. How many times do you hear about gripes between attorneys and the citizens? The biggest gripe they have is, well, he never said nothing about that, or she never said nothing about that. Well, she didn't do this, or she didn't do that. Well, why? Because they don't know the case as good as you do. You're the one that knows your best case. The only thing they know is how to apply the law. So all I'm telling you is learn how to apply the law in your constitutional rights, and then you don't need to do that. The only time you get into trouble is if you run your mouth too much and you get into self-incrimination. So obviously you have to keep your wits about you and watch your mouth. 
But the bottom line is, actually, I personally believe you are the best person to present the facts of your case because you're the best person that knows all the facts. The only thing you knew, know how to do is how to actually do it in a legal and lawful manner that is recognized by the legal community. And that's really not hard to learn. I can teach you, believe me. All right, the Seventh Amendment. In suits of the common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. It's supposed to say shall remain. And no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States, because the jury is the ultimate trier of fact. Then according to the rules of the common law. Hmm? Now, we'll get into that common law argument. There's a lot of heavy arguments around that common law. Basically, I don't want to overwhelm you on the first time out of the chute. <coughs> because that's not hard to do, okay? Now the bottom law, line of this Constitution is it's all in writing. It clearly represents a contract. I'm asking you to learn your contract. I'm asking you to learn the book. Learn your contract. I mean, when you go to some place to do some work on your car, you read the document that comes with it for the warranty, don't you? Why? Because just in case something goes wrong, you want to be able to bring it back, right? Well, I'm asking you to read the warranty on your Constitution so that you can understand the rights that you have under that Constitution. So that if you don't get it right, we can bring it back. Does that make sense to you? All right. Now, it's also important that you understand that this Constitution is a very unique document. And that this Constitution is supposed to be enforced, and I'm going to teach you some things here right now. This is a program, I don't know how it's coming out here, this right here is representation. I know it's kind of hard to see here, but basically what we're talking about here is this comes from the books that tell the judge how, right here and over here, this comes and tells the judge how the Constitution is to be interpreted. This is from the Am Jurisprudence volumes, and this is volume 16 you want the constitutional law section, right here, constitutional law, and you want section 97. And when you start reading it, the most important part about it, and I'll read it is, that a constitution should, relieve, should receive a liberal interpretation in favor of the citizen is especially true with respect to those provisions which were designed to safeguard the liberty and security of the citizen in regard to both person and property. Can you see that? Can you all see that? Is that coming out right here? Over more. Okay. All right. To safeguard the liberty and security of the citizen in regard to both person and property. See Note 31, Briars First United States, 273 U.S. 28, and all of these 40 Supreme Court cases hold that axiom. In other words, it's supposed to be liberally enforced in favor of the citizen for the protection of rights and property. And a constitutional provision intended to confer a benefit should be liberally construed in favor of the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary. 32. But on 32, DeJammer versus Hospital Authority of Albany in all of these cases. Okay, can you see that? All right, help me out here. Okay, is it in? All right. I'm just trying to tell you. You can go look this up and you can better see it. Can you see it clearly now? Okay. All right, now, let's do that over again. And a constitutional provision intended to confer a benefit should be liberally construed in favor of the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary. Similarly, a provision intended... Similarly, a provision intended... to afford a remedy to those who have just claims should receive a beneficial construction for the purpose of extending the remedy to all who might fairly come within the meaning of the terms. And that's Ryder versus Fitchie of Ohio, a Supreme Court case, okay? That's note number 33, okay? Now, this comes out of 16th Dam Jurisprudence. In other words, I have this Constitution. This Constitution is a contract in writing enforceable in the court of law pursuant to the statute of frauds. I'm asking for specific performance, Your Honor, in favor of me. I am the beneficiary of the contract. There's also a basic premise in contract law, basic contract law 101 of any first year law student that says, the contract shall be enforced most favorably in favor of the non-preparer. And that's you. You didn't prepare it. Now if you believe honestly that you have a right 
and you can timely bring that right before a proper adjudicated authority, and you can clearly stipulate as to what your right was, guess what? They got to listen. That's the way it is. That's the way it's supposed to be. And I'm telling you, if you know your rights and you timely assert those rights, you have those rights. But if you sit on your haunches and you cry foul, <coughs> it's just terrible. Somebody ought to do something about that. Hey, be a somebody. Do something about it. Don't sit there telling me that somebody ought to do something about that. Be a somebody. You do something about it. You honestly got an honest bitch, you go out there and you take care of it. Because that's what it takes to be an American. That's what, all, that's what it's all about. That's what being an American is all about. That's what separates you from the rest of the whole world. Because Americans, you don't trample on their rights because they're going to come get you. You do not trample on their rights. They won't put up with it. So be an American and don't put up with it. Stand up there and be counted. Now I want to read the next argument there, which is argument number 98, which basically deals with the effect of an emergency. Argument 98. Does everybody see that there? Get it there? Pretty good? All right. Argument 98. While an emergency cannot create power and no emergency justifies the violation of any of the provisions of the United States Constitution or state constitutions, public emergencies such as economic depression, all right, I'll go over here to the next page, what happened here, all right, all right, let's go. For especially liberal construction of constitutional powers, and it has been declared that because of national exigency, it is the policy of the courts in times of national peril so liberally to construe the special powers vested in the chief executive as to sustain and effectuate the purpose thereof, and to that end also more liberally to construe the constituted division and classification of the powers of the coordinate branches of the government, and insofar as may not be clearly inconsistent with the Constitution, right? In other words, they can't be in conflict with the Constitution to vest extraordinary powers in the chief executive but I'm telling you on the other hand a contention that a grave emergency such as the depression should permit construction of the constitutional provisions which would meet the emergency was rejected in one case the court holding that neither the legislature nor any executive or judicial officer may disregard the provisions of the constitution in cases of an emergency where the plain and unequivocal terms of the constitution present to question of construction as to departures in emergencies. So not even an emergency justifies the taking away of constitutional provisions. And I know you've heard differently. I know you think, well, they got an emergency. They just declare an emergency and then they, the president issues an executive order. But let me ask you, if it's a repugnant to the Constitution of the United States, is it law? No. Who says so? We do. We're the people. It's our country. It's our Constitution. We're the ones that say you can't do that. And we mean it. You damn well better listen. All right, now, Let's get into the next argument here. Now, I'm, I hope I'm not boring you to tears here, but it's kind of important that we cover these basic things so that you can understand. As to the construction ref with reference to the common law, an important canon of construction is that, that constitutions must be construed with reference to the common law. That means the law of the little people out there, not the corporations. Okay? Since it, in most respects the federal and state constitutions did not repudiate but cherished the established common law, this fact has been taken into consideration by the courts in construing certain clauses in a state constitution, such as the provision securing the right to a jury trial. Also provisions in regard to crimes have been interpreted with reference to the common law rule that one that one charged with a crime may be convicted of a lesser offense necessarily included in the crime charged. In such cases, the courts of the state always regard the language in the common law sense. So the common law prevails. Don't let anybody tell you this admiralty law prevails, because it only prevails if you get sucked into it. We're not going to let you do that. We're going to teach you how to beat it. The common law also permitted destruction of the abatement of nuisances by summary proceedings. Traffic tickets, folks. That's what a traffic ticket does. It is a writ of assistance, a bill of attainder. It's unlawful in the United States of America. And it was never supposed that a constitutional provision was intended to interfere with this established principle. And although there is no common law of the United States in the sense, who said so? Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. Okay? All right. Of a national customary law, 
as distinguished from the common law of England, adopted in the several states. In interpreting the federal constitution, recourse may still be had to the aid of the common law of England. It has been said that without reference to this common law, the language of the federal constitution could not be understood. <laughs> so the common law applies, folks. And we're going to get into that common law heavily in the advanced section, all right? Now let's get back into this. In interpreting the federal constitution adopted by the several states, all right, the recourse may still be had to the aid of the common law of England. It has been said that without reference to the common law, the language of the United States Constitution would not be understood. This is due to the fact that this instrument and the plan of government of the United States were founded on the common law as established in England at the time of the revolution. Okay, therefore it is the general rule that the phrases in the Bill of Rights taken from the common law must be construed in reference to the latter. Specifically, the United States Supreme Court has taken the common law into consideration in construing the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment provisions relating. All right, so the common law is extremely important that we get, and we will cover that thoroughly. It's important to understand that most of you out there are citizens at the common law that only, only those that understand the differences in admiralty and maritime law, those that are corporations, officers of corporations, or officers of government residing in the District of Columbia, the 14th Amendment duality of citizenship, which is talked about in the case of Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, which is a rather heavy argument. And I will cover that thoroughly with you so that you understand where the traps and the differences are. But for right now, I'm trying to demonstrate to you construction and programming so that you can understand that this Constitution right here is the supreme law of the land. It is a contract in writing. It is enforceable in favor of you. In an open court of law, you are the beneficiary. Okay? I want to give you some basic more points on this Am Jurisprudence argument. This is section 114 of the 16th volume of Am Jurisprudence Second. I'm going to give you a couple more of these sites so that you can understand how powerful a document this is. Okay? Let's go to the next section, which is 115, which is her, uh, Let's see, which one? 117. 117 is the next serious section. They're all serious. By the way, I highly recommend you go down to the law library, grab that 16th volume, Am Jurisprudence, start at section 1, and start paging through to section 300. You will absolutely be astounded. We are now in 16th Am Jurisprudence, second, section 117. And I will read it to you. Basically, various facts and circumstances extrinsic to the Constitution are often resorted to by the courts to aid them in determining its meaning. As previously noted, however, such extrinsic aids may not be resorted to where the provision in the question is clear and unambiguous. In such a case, the courts must apply the terms of the Constitution as written and they are not at liberty to search for meanings beyond the instrument, which that militia argument and that collective law theory of the Second Amendment is. They're reaching. They're reaching far. All right? Clearly it says in the plain English, the right of the people to keep and carry arms shall not be infringed. Now, what is it you don't understand about the word infringed? They're infringing. The Brady Bill, it's infringement. 1968 Gun Control Act, it's infringing. All of these, uh, the CCW Acts of these states, they're infringing. Who says so? You do. How shall a document be enforced in favor of who? You. When are you going to enforce it? You're the one that is the, the citizen. All power is inherent in the people. You're the one with the power. Enforce your power. All right? Does everybody understand that argument? That's the magnificence. I'm bringing the genie out. We're stroking the bottle here, and I'm going to bring the genie out here in a second. You're going to understand the magnificence of the power of this book. You see, once you understand this is an ironclad contract, once you understand that this is enforceable in the court of law pursuant to the statute of frauds, once you understand you have a right to claim specific performance on the contract, your Honor, I'm demanding my right to keep and carry arms, and that right shall not be infringed. I want specific performance. I am the holder of the contract. It's supposed to be enforced in favor of me. I am the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary, the citizen. I want the thing protected in, in favor of my right. Does that make logical sense to you? Now do you start to understand the power of this document? Okay? 
See, before, you just thought it was a bunch of writing in some, uh, in some uh, textbook that you had to take when you took a civics class in high school in the 11th grade. See, I want you to understand that you don't leave home without this. This is more important than your credit card. Okay? Next, let's get into the next section. I'm going to cover some more of these AM jurisprudence sections so that you can understand. I want to get into uh, section 155. 16th Am Jurisprudence, Second Section 155. Since the Constitution is intended for the observance of the judiciary as well as other departments of government, and the judges are sworn to, prov to support its provisions, got me, sworn, as an oath of office, sworn, the courts are not at liberty to overlook or disregard its commands or countenance evasions thereof. It is their duty in authorized proceedings to give full effect to the existing Constitution and to obey all constitutional provisions irrespective of their opinion as to the wisdom or the desirability of such provisions and irrespective of the consequences. Thus it is said that the courts should be in our alert to enforce the provisions of the United States Constitution and guard against their infringement by legislative fiat or otherwise. In accordance with these basic principles, the rule is fixed that the duty in the proper case to declare a law unconstitutional cannot be declined and must be performed in accordance with the deliberate judgment of the tribunal before which the validity of the enactment is directly drawn into question. If the Constitution prescribes one rule and the statute another and a different rule it is the duty of the courts to declare that the Constitution and not the statute governs in cases before them for judgment. Does everybody understand that? He's, they're telling the judge, you got to rule in favor of the Constitution. And if you know your Constitution, whose favor are they going to rule in? Yours. But you have to have enough hair on your tail feather to walk in there and say, hey, I'm an American. And I have a constitutional right. That right shall not be infringed, and you're infringing. And I'm asking you not to do that, because it's not nice. And I'm asking the judge to do his duty under his sworn oath of office and uphold the United States Constitution as he swore he would under Article 11, Paragraph 1 in this state, which says that, that he shall swear to protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, and he will perform his duties to the best of his ability, so help him God. Now, let's get closer to so help him God. Now, let's get into another one of these. We've got a load of them, folks, so let's bear with me here. 16th Am Jurisprudence, 2nd Section 177. Declaratory judgments. Declaratory judgment actions have often been utilized to test the constitutionality of a statute and government practices. The Uniform Declaratory Judgments Act makes specific provisions of the determination of construction or validity of statutes and municipal ordinance by declaratory judgment and is considered to furnish a particularly appropriate method for the determination of controversies relative to the construction and validity of the statutes and of ordinances. The Federal Declaratory Judgment Act, although it does not mention declar declarations as to the construction or validity of the statutes, has been invoked frequently as a means of assaying the constitutionality of congressional legislation. A plaintiff can have a declaratory judgment action on the constitutionality of either the federal or state statute by a single federal judge so long as he does not ask to have the operation of the statute enjoined you can't enjoin a constitutional right a court may grant declaratory relief unless there is a case of controversy before the court that is the dispute must consist of specific adverse claims based upon present rather than future or speculative facts on which to base the adjudication All right. I'm trying to tell you folks here, you have a right to demand a declaratory judgment, which we are going to do in several of our cases here. And they got to declare. Is it constitutional or isn't it constitutional? If it's constitutional, it has to be judged in favor of who? You, the citizen. Why? Because you're the, the beneficiary. It's supposed to be enforced in favor of you, the beneficiary, the citizen, for the protection of rights and property. See Briars v. United States, 273 U.S. 28. And the 40 Supreme Court cases that support that mandate. Okay? Now let's get, there's just a couple more here, bear with me. I know you're probably bored to tears right now, but I don't want you to do that. I want you to pay attention. Okay, we're at section 255. 
16th Am Jurisprudence, Section 255. In all instances where the court exercises its power to invalidate legislation on constitutional grounds, the conflict of the statute with the Constitution must be irreconcilable. The Brady Bill. Irreconcilable. Huh? In other words, the court is without authority to declare a statute unconstitutional unless it is in positive or direct conflict with the statute or with the Constitution. Thus, a statute is not to be declared unconstitutional unless so inconsistent with the Constitution that it cannot be enforced without a violation thereof. Because that would be violating the Constitution. We can't have that. What happened in Marbury v. Madison? 5 U.S. 137, same thing. A clear incompatibility between law and the Constitution must exist before the judiciary is justified in holding the law unconstitutional. This principle of, is, of course, in line with the rule that doubts as to constitutionality should be resolved in favor of the constitutionality and the beneficiary, you, the citizen, for the protection of your rights and property. Okay? Does everybody pick up on that? Now, let's, let's shift to 256. 256, right here. The general rule is that an unconstitutional statute, whether federal or state, though having the form and name of law, is in reality no law but is wholly void and ineffective for any purpose, since unconstitutionality dates from the time of the enactment and not merely from the date of the decision so branding it. And wouldn't it be interesting if 34, 34, where's 34? There's 33, where's 34? Here, 34. There's 35, all right, here's 34. State X Rel versus... Nguyen v. Greer, but I'll tell you what, Marbury v. Madison comes higher than that, okay? All right, 34, let's cover that again. And ineffective for any purpose. Since the unconstitutionality dates from the time of the enactment and not merely from the date of the decision so branding it, an unconstitutional law in legal contemplation is as inoperative as if it never had been passed. The Brady Bill, the Crime Bill, the 1968 Gun Control Bill, all these bills. Such a statute leaves the question that it purports to settle just as it would be had the statute not ever been enacted. All right? Let's go on. No repeal. No repeal of an enactment is necessary. Since an unconstitutional law is void, the general principles follow that it imposes no duties, confers no rights, creates no office, bestows no power or authority on anyone, affords no protection, and justifies no acts performed under it. A contract, did everybody pick up on that keyword, contract? A contract which rests on an unconstitutional statute creates no obligation to be impaired by subsequent legislation. No one is bound to obey an unconstitutional law, and no courts are bound to enforce it. Persons convicted and fined under a statute subsequently held unconstitutional may recover the fines paid. A void act cannot be legally inconsistent with a valid one, and an unconstitutional law cannot operate to supersede an existing valid law. Indeed, insofar as a statute runs counter to the fundamental law of the land, the Constitution, it is superseded thereby. Since an unconstitutional statute cannot repeal or in any way affect an existing one, if a repealing statute is unconstitutional, the statute which it attempts to repeal remains in full force, in effect. And where a... Cl well, what did I say there? It remains in full force, in effect. Is the Second Amendment in full force, in effect? You better believe it. Okay? Now, what is it they don't understand about infringed? And where a statute which it attempts to repeal remains in full force, in effect. And where a clause repealing a prior law is inserted in the Act, which act is unconstitutional and void, the provision of the repeal of the prior law will usually fall with it and will not be permitted to operate as repealing such prior law. In other words, the law stands always, the real law, the Constitution. The general principles stated above apply to the Constitutions as well as to the laws of several states insofar as they are repugnant to the Constitution and the laws of the United States. And let's see if 54 will confer. Kuhn versus Berry, but I can tell you Marbury versus Madison is higher than that, but I'd be willing to bet you they cited Marbury in that. Moreover, a constitution of a statute, a construction of a statute, which brings in conflict with a constitution will nullify it as effectively as if it had, in its expressed terms, been enacted in conflict therewith. So, anything passed in conflict with the United States Constitution is clearly unconstitutional. It doesn't take a college professor graduating magnum cum laude from Harvard to figure these things out. 
All you have to do is read. That's why God gave you eyes now. The actual existence. Well, let's go to 257. 257, same book, 16th Ham Jurisprudence. The actual existence of a statute prior to determination that it is unconstitutional is an, in, as, is an operative fact and may have consequences which cannot justify being ignored when a statute which has been in effect for some time is declared unconstitutional questions of rights claimed to have become vested of status of prior determinations deemed to have finality and acted upon accordingly of prior determinations deemed to have finality and acted upon accordingly and of public policy in the light of the nature both of the statute and of its previous application demand examination All right. It has been said that an all-inclusive statement of the principle of absolute retroactive invalidity cannot be justified. Obviously, it would be ex post facto. An unconstitutional statute is not necessarily a nullity. It may have indeterminate consequences binding upon the people. All right? So you have to pay attention to what's going on. Now, let's get a few more and we're out of here. Section 258. I'm just going to read the important section here. On the other hand, it is clear that Congress cannot by authorization or ratification give the slightest effect to a state law or constitution which is in conflict with the Constitution of the United States. Does that make sense to you? In reality, it would be what? A nullity. Why? Because it's in conflict or repugnancy. It'd be in violation of Marbury versus Madison, all right? Now, are you starting to see the gist of what's going on here? There's just one more, I think, and we're out of here. All right, section 260 of the same 16th Ham jurisprudence. Now, folks, head down to the law library. The books are usually green or red in color. They're kind of thick. Ask the librarian where Ham jurisprudence second is stored. Go on over there, grab the 16th volume, start at section 1, and just start paging through to say section 300. I'm telling you, you won't believe it. We're going to look at section 260. Although it is manifest that an unconstitutional provision in the statute is not cured because included in the same act with valid provisions and that there are no degrees of constitutionality <laughs> in other words it's either constitutional or it's unconstitutional there's nothing like it's kind of like half pregnant there's no such thing all right so that an act is either constitutional or it is unconstitutional okay so if you got statute here and most of it's constitutional and a part of it's unconstitutional guess what it's all unconstitutional so what we got here is a crime bill and we got part of it as constitutional and part of it's unconstitutional. Obviously, they had no authority under the Second Amendment to fool around with the right of the people to keep and bear arms. They couldn't demand that the people not possess certain firearms. So, this directly applies to this crime bill. Obviously, part of the bill is constitutional and the other part is not constitutional. So, what is the end result? The whole bill is unconstitutional. Does everybody see that? Excuse me. Now, I want you to start looking at these things, and I want you to start hammering these guys, and don't let these guys pull this kind of stuff. Hook them. Over there in column, say, uh, hey, Charlie, why don't you step over here for a minute? I want to check out something here. I mean, you would if they had your wallet, wouldn't you? Does that make sense to you? Now, we're going to get into a unique argument here. <clears throat> for the last half hour, I've been trying to hammer home the power of this book. This book right here. I'm trying to hammer home the power of this book to teach you that this is the most valuable book in your whole life. If you know what's in this book, I am telling you, you are in full possession of your American citizenship. If you don't know what's in this book, I am telling you, you're going to be a slave, subject to the whim of extrajudicial people who want to tell you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and how high to pack it. Now, my honest philosophy to you is, as a kindness and a Christian to you, I tell you, learn this book, just like you would your... ...any rights. I love it when these guys tell me I don't have any rights. I say, well, if you believe that, let's go to court. And on the end of the day, we'll see who owns who. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you violate any of my constitutional rights... I will sue your socks off, and I will attach everything you own, bank, business, and home. And I'm telling you, I'm the one your mama warned you about, so you damn well better listen. Don't violate my rights. 
because I will come after you, and I will take care of business, and I will do what is necessary and proper, and I will pull every stop out, and I will go dig up every nut, bolt, and screw, and when it's done, you will find out you messed with the wrong American, because this American is not going to back down. Okay? Now, we're going to get into a real special argument. Now, this argument has taken almost 18 and a half years to develop, so I want you to pay attention. Excuse me a second here. This argument is a unique concept that has been honed like a razor to a very meticulous edge so that you can understand what's going on. Obviously, we have established clearly that you have a constitutional right. And obviously we have established that you are the beneficiary of the contract. And we have established that the Constitution is a contract in writing enforceable in the court of law. And we have established that you have a right to claim specific performance on the contract. And we have established that it's supposed to be interpreted in your favor. So if you've got an honest constitutional belief, they have to listen. Now let's take that to the next step. The next step is, can a state arbitrarily and erroneously convert your right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it? Now, uh, I don't know if you, can you see this pretty clearly, this uh, right here? All right, let's start start with here. We're going to start walking down this sheet, okay? Murdoch versus Pennsylvania, U.S. Supreme Court. Now, when you want to go into the law library and you want to look up something, what you want to do is understand that Supreme Court is Trump, okay? That's the clearest way I can explain it to you. If you've got a Supreme Court case, that trumps a, a, a district court, that trumps a, a court of appeals, that trumps a state court, that trumps everything. So you want to deal with Supreme Court cases as best you can. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania is a unique case. It's recorded at 319 U.S. 105. That's the 319th volume of United States Supreme Court reports on page 105. So when you go to the law library, go into U.S. reports, Ask the little gal there, the little guy that's behind the counter, where is the United States Supreme Court reports? They'll tell you right where it is. You grab volume 319, you turn to page 105, and it'll give you the case of Murdoch versus Pennsylvania. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania is a real unique case. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to read the case. You get the case. The judge always likes to see that you're ready. And I'm going to summate basically the case briefly. Basically, it is a religious test case wherein Jehovah's Witnesses, in the, in the year of 1943, wanted their right to be able to go and preach among the public, because that is their right to evangelize, okay? Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, they wanted them to have a license to solicit, okay? This is basically the crux of the case. Now, what happened was, uh, this, the Jehovah's Witness claimed their First Amendment right of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the right to worship and, and uh, exercise their religion, unencumbered, right? And, of course, that's one of the mainstays that, that founded this country, was the religious freedom, okay? And basically, the points on the case that are established are, a state may not impose a charge for the enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution, and that a flat license tax here involved restrains in advance the constitutional liberties of press and religion and inevitably tends to suppress their existence. All right, let's pull that over there. Everybody see that? Okay. All right, I'll start again. A state may not impose a charge for the re enjoyment of a right granted by the federal constitution and that a flat license tax here involved restrains in advance the constitutional liberties of the press and religion and inevitably tends to suppress the exercise thereof, that the ordinance is non-discriminatory and that it applies also to peddlers of wares and merchandise is immaterial. The liberties granted by the First Amendment are and in a preferred position. Since the privilege in question is guaranteed by the federal constitution and exists independently of the state's authority, the inquiry as to whether the state has given something for which it cannot ask a return is irrelevant. All right? No state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. Now, a lot of people come back to me and say, well, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, so that case doesn't apply to me. I want you to reach. I want you to understand we're not talking about whether you're a Jehovah's Witness here. What we're talking about here is are you an American and do you have rights? What they are talking about here is that these Jehovah's Witness people exercise their rights timely. 
that they had a right to worship and exercise and, and, and worship their God and evangelize as they chose, and that the state came in and arbitrarily converted that right into a privilege and issued a license and a fee for it. That is totally unconstitutional. Now, we took that case as a pioneering case, and we argued that case for all of your constitutional rights. All you need to do is keep in mind that you are an American and you have constitutional rights, number one. Number two, you have to keep in mind what right. Can you pull the right out of the Constitution? If you can pull the right out of the Constitution, and I'll give you an example. How about the right to travel freely and encumbered, pursuant to Shapiro versus Thompson, and we'll get into that. How about the right to keep and bear arms, right? Does a state have a right to require a license and a fee for the exercise of the right? And if they do, can you ignore the license and the fee? We'll get into that. Now, obviously... In this case, it's clearly established, and this is the premise of this case, no state may convert a secured liberty into a privilege, issue a license and a fee for it, and require you to have that. Otherwise, you committed a crime. That's totally, 100% unconstitutional. I want that to get across real clear. Now let's jump to the next case. By the way, Murdoch is recorded at 319. That's the 319 volume. U.S. Reports, page 105. We'll start the case. All right? Go read the case, though. Make sure you read the case. I don't want anybody to come up and tell me they didn't read the case, because I'm going I'm to get on you. You're not following. That's failure to follow instructions. Okay? Now, we're going to walk down the next step of this case. We, we took care of Murdoch here. Let's go to Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, which is recorded at volume 373. You same U.S. reports, you go to volume 373, turn to page 262. When we go to Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, this is another unique religious case, okay? In this case, six ministers were accused, excuse me, of inciting to riot and otherwise create a disturbance and disturb the peace, Okay? They had a sit-down. This case came down in 1962. And what happened was they said they needed to have a license to, to have a public uh, gathering. Okay? And what happened was it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, no, 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 you don't need to have a license for the exercise of a First Amendment right to freely assemble. Okay? Right, basically, the, the gist of the case is... Uh, the Negro ministers were convicted in Alabama State Court of aiding and abetting in violation of criminal trespass ordinance in Birmingham, Alabama. The only evidence against them was to the effect that they had incited 10 Negro students to engage in a sit-down demonstration at a white lunch counter. Actually, there were six ministers, but only two got charged. As a protest against the racial segregation. And they cite other cases. A lot of times you can find other cases in these cases. In Gober versus City of Birmingham, Alabama, this court today holds on the authority of Peterson versus City of Greenville that the convictions of those ten students for criminal trespass were constitutionally invalid. Since those convictions have been set aside, it follows that these petitioners did not incite or aid and abet any crime, and that therefore the convictions of these petitioners must be set aside. Now basically what they were claiming is their constitutional right to freely assemble? The cities was claiming that they had to have a license to put on a demonstration, which they didn't have, and they were charging them with a criminal trespass for not having a valid license to freely assemble and or uh, protest, okay? Now, the gist of this case, I want you to see the significance of this case in view of the, second ca uh, the, ne the case we gave you before that. Murdoch versus Pennsylvania clearly established that no state could convert a secured liberty and a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it, because everybody got that. Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama said that if the state does convert your right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it, you can ignore the license and a fee and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. They've got to let you go. All right? Does everybody see that? It's very important that you understand, first, your constitution is the supreme law of the land and you have that right and that that right shall not be infringed, and it's supposed to be enforced in favor of you, the clearly intended and expressly designated beneficiary. It's very important that you understand that no state may convert that right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee for it. And if they do, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, says you can ignore the license and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. Now, the next case is very important, and it's very important that you see the argument. Okay? That's United States versus Bishop. That's 412, volume 412, United States Reports. This is page 346. We come down here. 
United States versus Bishop is a very unique case. Basically what Bishop does is it sets a standard for what constitutes a criminal violation in terms of willful intent. Okay? Willfulness is, is one of the major elements that is required to be proven. In any criminal element, you have to prove, one, that you're the party, two, that you had a method or an opportunity to do the thing, and third, that you did so with a willful intent. Now, when we get to willful intent, willful is defined as an evil motive or intent to avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty. Obviously, in the previous two cases, you have decided that you have relied on the United States Constitution. And you have relied on decisions of the United States Supreme Court. So, could you have willfully done any deed or crime? Obviously not. So, guess what? This case stipulates that you have a perfect defense to the element of willfulness. All right? Since the burden on the prosecution is to prove that you did willfully and knowingly avoid a known duty or task under the law with a moral certainty, he cannot perform that task, can he? Because it's obviously you have a constitutional immunity to that. The previous case, Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham, Alabama, says they couldn't even punish you. The case before that said you didn't need a license for the exercise of a right. And the case before that said your constitutional right is supreme over any state law. So if they pass the law in violation of your constitution, the constitution overwhelms the state law. So the law doesn't even exist in law. Does everybody see that? Now, since the prosecutor does not have a cause of action for which relief can be granted, Your Honor, may it please the court, counsel is specifically precluded from performing his major task. Therefore, Your Honor, may it please the court, at this time I would motion most graciously for a dismissal with prejudice for failure to state a cause of action for which relief may be granted by this honorable court, and I'd kind of like to collect my costs and fees for having to defend this patently frivolous and spurious complaint, sir. May it please the court. Laughter will usually break out thereafter, at which point the judge will usually turn to the prosecutor and say, Well, Mr. Pros, what do you think we ought to do about this young fella? And he'll say, I'd go for the motion to dismiss, Your Honor, and the judge will turn to him and say, That's a good answer, because I don't think you're ready for this kid today. And 40 attorneys will break out laughing. Okay, that's actually happened to me, folks. I'm telling you, this argument is a killer argument. It's good for every single constitutional right you've got. All you have to do is fill in the blanks. What constitutional right? Prove that you have the constitutional right. Tell them the state doesn't have a right to convert that right into a privilege. Tell them that they can't even punish you if they do. And then claim that the prosecutor can't prove willfulness, so you obviously didn't do no crime. And then flip around and demand for your dismissal, which is your right, and get your costs and fees for having to defend this frivolous case. May it please the court. And I promise you, you will be amazed. Forty attorneys will jump up and say, Yeah! They'll come up and shake your hand and tell you that's one of the most magnificent arguments they've ever heard. They'll tell you you got something like King Kong for taking on the Bar Association or whatever. Now, I'm telling you these things that personally happened to me, I can relate the exact cases. That goes for practicing law without a license. Obviously, you got a right to work. you got a right to contract your, your, your right to work as you see fit, not as some arbitrary and capricious Bar Association sees fit. Right? Doesn't that make sense to you? You don't want to belong to the union, that's your right. This is a this is a right to work state, right? The bottom line is this. They cannot compel you to have a license or pay a fee for the exercise of your right. And if they do, you can ignore the license and a fee and engage in the right with impunity. That means they can't punish you. And since you got a perfect defense to the element of willfulness, they cannot punish you. They have to dismiss. They do not have a cause of action. Now this argument I'm telling you is taken plus over 18 years to develop in courts and in law libraries over the years and just kind of compiling and arguing cases and doing this. This argument is a killer argument. There have yet, have they ever won against us on this argument? Uh, nor could they in the United States of America as long as the Constitution stands. I'm asking that you pay attention to this argument and start utilizing it. We'll show you some of the techniques later in the second half, all right? Now the word willfully has the same meaning, all right? in controlling the voluntary, intentional violation of a known legal duty. And the distinction between the statute is found in the additional misconduct that is essential to the violation of the felony provision. If they can't prove willfulness, they can't prove nada. Okay? Because everybody got that. Now, let's go to the next one. Now that you've won and your rights have been violated, the next thing they will claim, well, we acted in good faith, or well, we acted in good faith, we had good faith reliance that you broke the law. Okay? And that means you can't sue us. 
That's a lie. You see, since these two cases, Owen versus City of Independence, which is recorded at 100 volume, and you want to look at Supreme Court reports. Now, that's a different reporter. Supreme Court reports will actually say on the back of the reporter, Supreme Court reports. It won't say U.S., it'll say Supreme Court reports. So, so that's a different volume. It's a newer, a newer reporter. So you want the 100th volume, and you want to look up Supreme Court reports, and you want to turn to page 1398. There is a... A, also a uh, counterpart case to this Owen case, which is, Memp which is uh, Maine versus Thibodeau. I'll give you the site for those. Okay, I gave you Owen versus Save Any Penance, so I'll give you Maine versus Thibodeau. Maine versus Thibodeau is recorded at 100 Supreme Court, that's 100th volume, Supreme Court Reports, page 2502. Now, basically, the summation of what these, what, the, what these basic arguments say. Where plain language of a statute supported by consist, consistent judicial interpretation is strong, it is not necessary to look beyond the words of the statute, right? Now, what, these are both civil rights cases. The right of action created by statute relating to deprivation under color of law, of state law, of a right secured by the Constitution and the laws of the United States encompasses claims which are based solely on statutory violations of federal law and apply to the claim that claimants had been deprived of their rights in some capacity to which they were entitled. Now, whenever this happens, folks, you must understand something. And that goes for both Maine versus Thibodeau and Owen versus City of Independence. And I'll tell you the brief synopsis on both these cases. Owen was a police chief in a town of Independence, Missouri. And he got in a gripe with the city council and they indiscriminately fired him without just cause. Owen turned around and sued. They claimed that they acted in good faith. The Supreme Court said, Sir, you are deemed to be officers of the law. You are to advise us to the law. You can hardly claim that you acted in good faith for a willful deprivation of the law, and you certainly can't claim ignorance of the law because a citizen out here on the street can't claim ignorance of the law, and it makes the law look stupid if an officer of the court or some officer of government doesn't know the law, and then they go ahead and abuse somebody's constitutional rights. So in matters of constitutional rights, both these cases uphold one point, and the point they uphold is that whenever they violate your constitutional rights, they do so at their own peril, and it even says that in Title 18, United States Code section 241 and 242. It says that upon conviction you are subject to a $10,000 fine, 10 years in jail, or both, and if death results, life in prison. They're telling you don't violate somebody's rights. Please, don't do that. Title 42, United States Code sections 1983, 1985, and 1986 clearly establish your right to sue anybody that does that. Now, they're going to claim you can't sue them because they have judicial immunity. Well, guess what? These two cases remove judicial immunity. There is no judicial immunity for violating somebody's constitutional rights. Judge, you are deemed to know the law and sworn to uphold it. You can hardly claim that you act in good faith for willful deprivation of the law, and you certainly can't plead ignorance of the law. For that, it would make the law look stupid for a knowledgeable judge to claim ignorance of the law when a citizen on the street can't claim ignorance of the law. Therefore, there is no judicial immunity. I want to get that across. I don't know how many attorneys come up to me all the time telling me, well, they're immune because they acted in good faith. They're just not reading their court. They're not reading their court reports, because if they had read their court reports, they would have known this case has been on the books since 1982. Both, both these cases came down in 1982. So I want you to pay attention to these cases. When somebody tells you they can violate your rights with, with impunity, you just kind of smile and say, <laughs> make my day. Okay? Now, the next case we want to talk about is Briars versus United States. <clears throat> We mentioned it previously earlier. Breyers is recorded at 273, volume 273, U.S. Reports, page 28. Okay? Now, Breyers versus United States is a unique case. It's a search and seizure case. But basically it sets constitutional standards, which we had talked about in the AM jurisprudence sections. In the AM jurisprudence sections, okay? I especially want to pay attention to note number three here. Constitutional provisions for the security of a person and property are to be liberally construed, and it is the duty of the courts to be watchful for the constitutional rights of the citizen and against any stealthy encroachment therein. All right? When a federal officer participates officially with a state official in a search, so that in substance and effect, it is their joint operation, the legality of the search and the use and evidence of the things seized is to be tested in federal prosecutions. 
as it would be if the undertaking were exclusively the federal agent, all right? The reality here is what they are setting is the standards must be liberally construed in favor of the citizen. It's the duty of the court to make sure that happens. So now you have a right to be wrong. You have a right to uh, enter your viable defenses that you honestly think. No state can convert that right into a privilege and issue a license and a fee. If they do, you can ignore the license and the fee. They, have, must per, they must prove the burden of proof of willfulness, which they cannot do. If they do violate your rights, you do have a right to sue them in Owens versus City of Independence and Maine versus Thibodeau. They have to give every consideration to you, all right? And that's the way it is, 1900 yesterday, all right? The next case we want to talk about is Boyd. Boyd versus United States is recorded at... It's recorded at... Uh, 116, volume 116, United States Reports, page 616. So everybody got that? Can you see? Bear with us, folks. We're really trying to jam here for you. Boyd versus United States, 116 U.S., page 616. The court is to protect against encroachment of constitutionality or secured liberty. All right? Now, it is equivalent to a compulsory production of papers to make the non-production of them a confession of the allegations, which is is pretended they will prove. And a lot of times that happens in federal cases. They'll claim something, they won't prove it. That's happened to me, believe me. And then the fact that they've claimed it makes it true. Alright? Now this <coughs> excuse me. And then of course you have to prove a negative, which is impossible. Alright? Now, the seizure or compulsory production of a man's private papers to be used in evidence against him is equivalent to compelling him to be a witness against himself in violation of the Fifth Amendment and in a prosecution for a crime, penalty, or forfeiture is equally within the prohibition of the Fifth Amendment. See that? Now, the bottom line here is Boyd protects against encroachment of constitutionally secured liberties. It's arguing the Fifth Amendment here, but it's basically arguing against encroachment, all right? So that's one you want to pay attention to when you're coming, especially to things on search and seizure natures. Another good case that you should know is your Miranda versus Arizona. And folks, I'm going to tell you something, and even I can learn something. Not that I'm that much above you. I, I want to come to you hum humbly in humility. I'm, I'm telling you, I've read and I know, and there's a lot of things about the law, and I've been my own attorney for over 25 years, and I kick the tail out of them, I'll be honest with you. But I always can learn something, and I'm not stupid enough ever not to realize that. And the next thing I'm going to tell you is probably one of the most important things we're going to tell you today. This is the Miranda versus Arizona decision. It's recorded at 384, volume 384, U.S., that's U.S. Reports, page 436. Now, this is a heavy-duty case. Every American should know this case backward and forward, upside down and other. All right? Miranda versus Arizona. This is the one that says you got a right to remain silent, you got a right to an attorney, you got a right to have your attorney present during questioning. Anything you say can and will be held against you in a court of law. If you can't afford an attorney, want to be appointed for you by the court. Do you wish to make any statement on your behalf? Do you understand the rights that I have spoken to you? As soon as they stop you, talk to you, as soon as they start talking to you, they are required to say that. If they don't say that, they screwed up. If they haul you into jail and they don't tell you this, read it to you, and then they want to make you sign a little uh, statement that you know your rights and you knowingly waive them, please, folks, don't sign that statement. Use your head for something other than a hat rack. Do not sign that statement, ever. You are knowingly waiving your constitutional rights. Don't ever do that. I mean, they don't make... They don't make it that hard. As soon as you hear those people start talking it, you tell them right effectively, I want to talk to an attorney. And I'm not saying nothing until I talk to an attorney, especially if you're talking to federal people, BATF. These people will lie, cheat, steal. They will do anything they can to hammer you. Their whole purpose in life is to hammer you. I don't want you to think, well, oh, what nice guys, so maybe we can just work this out. Why don't we just talk and maybe we can get things worked out. You don't talk to these people, folks, and you're talking to somebody who learned the hard way. You do not talk to these people ever. I don't care if you think you're a nice guy and you want to be courteous. I don't think you think if you're going to work it out. I don't think you think if you're, gonna, you're smarter than they are and you can beat them. I'm telling you, you don't talk to them, period. You button that hatch. An old uh, wise uh, 
legal defense counsel told me one time, he said, the first rule is keep your big mouth shut. I said, okay, what's the second rule? Keep your big mouth shut. He said, what's the third rule? Keep your big mouth shut. I said, after you follow them three rules, the rest is easy. It's when you open your big mouth that you get in trouble. Not that you would do anything wrong anyway, but they'll twist, lie, cheat, and steal and make it into something you didn't do, and before you know it, you won't even recognize what's happened. And I'm telling you, it's happened to me. So I'm telling you as a friend. I'm not telling you as a smart ass or anything else. I'm telling you as a friend. Do not talk to these people. They, they do not have your best interest at heart. And you may think, well, they're the government, and, and they, they're responsible, and they mean well. Well, they don't. They don't mean well. They don't mean you're well, and they will jam you, believe me. And if you're not real good at getting out of it, you can, you can be in a lot of trouble. All right, now, let's look at this Miranda decision. In the absence of other effective measures, the following procedures to safeguard the Fifth Amendment privileges must be observed. The person in custody must, prior to interrogation, be clearly informed that he has a right to remain silent and that anything he says will be used against him in a court of law. He must be clearly informed that he has a right to consult with a lawyer and he, to have a lawyer with him during interrogation. Do that, please. And that if he is indigent, a lawyer will be appointed to represent him. All right? If the individual indicates prior to and during questioning that he wishes to remain silent, the interrogation must cease. If he states that he wants an attorney, the questioning must cease until an attorney is present. Where an interrogation is conducted without the presence of an attorney, and a statement is taken, a heavy burden rests on the government to demonstrate that the defendant knowingly and intelligently waived his constitutional counsel right. <sighs> Don't test that theory. But I'm telling you, it works. I did it. Where the individual answers some questions during interrogation or custody interrogation, he has not waived his privilege and may invoke his right to remain silent thereafter. The warnings require that the waiver needed are in the absence of a fully effective equivalent prerequisite to the admission or admissibility of any statement, inculpability or exculpability made by the defendant. The limitations on the interrogation process required for the protection of the individual's constitutional rights should not cause an undue interference with the proper system of law enforcement as demonstrated by the procedures of the FBI and the safeguards afforded to other jurisdictions. In each of these cases, the statements were obtained under circumstances that did not meet constitutional standards for protection of the privilege against self-incrimination. Now. This is the big one, folks. This is the one they're talking about. Did you properly Mirandize him? Was he Mirandized? Was she to Mirandize? If they don't Mirandize you, they got to throw the case out. Almost always. It's very hard to go forward with the case if their witnesses are excludable from the presentation of the case. Now, I personally got lucky on this one, folks. And I thought I was really, really good. And I am really, really good. But you want to know something? I have a different standard of equity and law. And I treat everybody kindly. And I basically give them courtesy. And I basically try and be a regular Joe. What happened? A regular Joe. And I basically uh, try to uh, basically just find out what the heck was going on with this case. I promise you I would never do that again. I would dummy up like there's no tomorrow. I wouldn't say nothing. Not that I'd do anything wrong, but here's the thing. These people lied so bad. They put so much trash in, in the record. I was in shock. I couldn't believe that anybody would deliberately do such a thing. But they will. So I'm telling you as a friend, do not talk to these people, especially BATF people. They are not honorable people. They don't hold... They do not recognize the honor you serve. They are not honorable people. Their whole purpose is to hammer you into a position of, of ridiculousness. So I'm telling you, if they come in to talk to you for whatever reason, I don't care what, you dummy up. You don't say nothing. You got me? You hire an attorney. You get an attorney there, and you don't talk till the attorney tells you to. And that's what I'm telling you as a friend, okay? That's Miranda versus Arizona. Now, there's four Miranda cases. This is the leading case. There is a Miranda warning case that actually locks down the, the steps of the warning. And then there's a Miranda interrogation case, which, which, which locks out the standards for uh, in-custody jail interrogations, okay? Now, 
A word to the wise should be sufficient, and I shouldn't have to ever say nothing about that again. Believe me, I learned a valuable lesson. You cannot assume that everybody is a good guy. There are some bad ones out there, <laughs> and I found them. Now the next case we're going to talk about is Norton versus Shelby County, recorded at 118 volume, United States Reports, page 425. Basically that says an unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights, it imposes no duties, affords no protections, it creates no office. It is in legal contemplation as an inoperative as though it had never been passed, okay? And that's what this, this case holds, all right? Now I'm telling you, you go read the case. Let's screw around. If the judge asks you questions about the case, you better know about what it says, all right? Because if he thinks you didn't read it, he's going to throw your case out. The court follows the decision of the highest court of the state in construing the Constitution and the laws of the state unless they conflict with or impair the eff efficacy of some principle of the federal Constitution or of the federal statutes or a rule of the commercial or general law. The decision of the state courts on questions relating to the existence of its subordinate tribunals and the eligibility and election or appointment of their officers and the passage of its laws are conclusive upon federal courts, all right? Now, the most important, some of the most important thing is, while acts of de facto incumbent of an office lawfully created by law and existing are often held to be binding from reasons of public policy. That's a very important point, public policy. You want to watch out for the terms public policy. It's often confused with the state's right of eminent domain of police powers. Police powers and public policy are almost the same thing, except one's done without law because we wants to, and the other is done because they're claiming a police authority to do so. All right? But when they're talking about public policy, the acts of the person assuming to fill and perform the duties of an office, which does not exist, can have no validity whatever in law. Okay? An unconstitutional act is not a law. It confers no rights. It imposes no duties. It affords no protection. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation as inoperative as though it had never been passed. Okay? Has everybody got that? Now, this basic first portion of this program is designed clearly to help you. And if you take these basic cases on this one page, you will have gone a long way in getting your constitutional rights back. Okay? Now, we're asking you to pay attention. Learn your Constitution. We're going to go into some heavier stuff through the second portion of that. But we want you to learn your Constitution. This book here is a citizen's rule book. It also has jury instructions in it. It also has a lot of important arguments in it. Some of the important arguments in it go along with what we've been talking about. Right? All laws which are repugnant Constitution are null and void. Marbury versus Madison, 5 yes, 137. We already argued that one. Where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rule or lawmaking or legislation which would abrogate or abolish them. That's again Miranda versus Arizona. An unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights and imposes no duties, affords no protection. It creates no office. All right, and that's Norton versus Shelby County, which we just talked about. The general rule is an unconstitutional statute, though having the form and name of law is in reality no law, but is wholly void. All right. 16th Am Jurisprudence, 2nd Section 177, and also 256. Officers of the court have no immunity when violating constitutional right from liability. That's Owen v. City of Independence and Maine v. Thibodeau. No state shall convert secured liberties into privileges and issue licenses and fees for them. Murdoch v. Pennsylvania. If the state does convert liber liberty or a privilege into a privileged citizen, can engage in a right with impunity. That's Shuttlesworth v. Birmingham, Alabama. The court is to protect against any encroachment of constitutionally secured liberties. That's Boyd versus United States. Constitutional rights must be interpreted in favor of the citizen. That's Briars versus United States. We have covered all of these cases thoroughly so that you can see clearly. All right? And we're trying to teach you how to better effectively use your Constitution. Okay? We're trying to get it down to a serious program where... What do you want to do? Open it up. All right. <clears throat> all right? And this, this book here also brings out all of these court cases, all right? Notice it's got Norton versus Shelby County in here. It's got Miranda versus Arizona. It's got Madison 5, Marbury versus Madison. It's got, uh, the jury has a right to judge both the law as well as the fact. John Jay, First Chief Justice, U.S. Supreme Court. The jury has the right to determine both the law and the fact. Samuel Chase, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, 1796. Singer, 
In it, all right. The jury has the power to bring a verdict in the teeth of both law and fact. Oliver Wendell Holmes, U.S. Supreme Court. The law itself is on trial quite as much as the cause, which is to be decided. Harlan F. Stone, 12th Chief Justice, U.S. Supreme Court. The pages of history shine on instances of the jury's exercise of its prerogative to disregard instructions of the judge. That's United States versus Doherty, 473 Fed Second 113. All right, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we're going to wrap up this first part here. Basically, we want, we want you folks to <clears throat> hopefully not be overwhelmed. Take your time. Play the tape several times. It'll, it'll come to you. It's really not that hard. We want you to have a new reverence for your Constitution. We want you to know that a lot of brave soldiers paid for it with their life. <coughs> Excuse me. We want you to know that they died miserably, some of them. And we want you to know that this is a serious, very serious thing here. We want you to know that we love you, America. <coughs> and we want you to know <coughs> we need your help. We need your help. <coughs> We need your help to learn your Constitution so you can better and effectively come forward, pick that book up, walk out there and shake that book and say, Shaking it, boss! <laughs>